conscience from the satire thirteen by juvenal translated anonymously from the latin from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox.org by craig franklin as the narrator and lian yao as the oracle conscience from satire thirteen the spartan rogue who boldly bent on fraud dared ask the god to sanction and applaud and sought for counsel at the pythian shrine received for answer from the lips divine that he who doubted to restore his trust and reasoned much reluctant to be just should for those doubts and that reluctance prove the deepest vengeance of the powers above the tale declares that not pronounced in vain came forth the warning from the sacred fane ere long no branch of that devoted race could mortal man on soil of sparta trace thus but intended mischief stayed in time had all the mortal guilt of finished crime if such his fate who yet but darkly dares whose guilty purpose yet no act declares what were it done ah now farewell to peace near on this earth his soul's alarm shall cease held in the mouth that languid fever burns his tasteless food he indolently turns on alba's oldest stock his soul shall pine forth from his lips he spits the joyless wine nor all the nectar of the hills shall now or glad the heart or smooth the wrinkled brow while o'er the couch his aching limbs are cast if care permit the brief repose at last lo there the altar and the fane abused or darkly shadowed forth in dream confused while the damp brow betrays the inward storm before him flits thy aggravated form then as new fears o'er all his senses press unwilling words the guilty truth confess these these be thy whom secret terrors try when muttered thunders shake the lurid sky whose deadly paleness now the gloom conceals and now the vivid flash anew reveals no storm as nature's casualty they hold they deem without an aim no thunders rolled where'er the lightning strikes the flash is thought judicial fire with heaven's high vengeance fraught passes this by with yet more anxious ear and greater dread each future storm they fear in burning vigil deadliest foe to sleep in their distemper frame if fever keep or the pain side their wonted rest prevent behold some incense god his bow has bent all pains all aches are stones and arrows hurled at bold offenders in this nether world from them no crested cock acceptance meets their lamb before the altar vainly bleats can pardoning heaven on guilty sickness smile or is their victim than itself more vile where steadfast virtue dwells not in the breast man is a wavering creature at the best end of poem this recording is in the public domain the foolish virgins by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, Lian Yao as the queen, and Sonia as the novice. The Foolish Virgins from Idols of the King, Guinevere. The queen looked up and said, O oh, maiden, if indeed you list to sing, sing and unbind my heart that I may weep whereat full willingly sang the little maid late late so late and dark the night and chill 
late late so late but we can enter still too late too late ye cannot enter now no light had we for that we do repent and learning this the bridegroom will relent too late too late ye cannot enter now no light so late and dark and chill the night oh let us in that we may find the light too late too late ye cannot enter now have we not heard the bridegroom is so sweet oh let us in though late to kiss his feet no no too late ye cannot enter now so sang the novice while full passionately her head upon her hands wept the sad queen end of poem this recording is in the public domain uphill by christina g rossetti from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia as the questions and jason in canada as the answers uphill does the road wind uphill all the way yes to the very end will the day's journey take the whole long day from morn to night my friend but is there for the night a resting place a roof for when the slow dark hours begin may not the darkness hide it from my face you cannot miss that inn shall i meet other wayfarers at night those who have gone before then must i knock or call when just in sight they will not keep you standing at that door shall i find comfort travel sore and weak of labor you shall find the sum will there be beds for me and all who seek yea beds for all who come end of poem this recording is in the public domain per pacem at lucem by adelaide n proctor from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia per pacem at lucem i do not ask o lord that life may be a pleasant road i do not ask that thou wouldst take from me aught of its load i do not ask that flowers should always spring beneath my feet i know too well the poison and the sting of things too sweet for one thing only lord dear lord i plead lead me aright though strength should falter and though heart should bleed through peace to light i do not ask o lord that thou shouldst shed full radiance here give but a ray of peace that i may tread without a fear i do not ask my cross to understand my way to see better in darkness just to feel thy hand and follow thee joy is like restless day but peace divine like quiet night lead me o lord till perfect day shall shine through peace to light end of poem this recording is in the public domain on his blindness by john milton from the world's best poetry volume four the high life part two read for librivox dot org by thomas peter as the narrator and lian yao as patience on his blindness when i consider how my light is spent ere half my days in this dark world and wide and that one talent which is death to hide lodged with me useless though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker 
and present my true account, lest he returning chide. Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask, but patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts, who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest, they also serve, who only stand and wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Martyr's Hymn by Martin Luther Translated from German by W. J. Fox From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Martyr's Hymn Flung to the heedless winds, or on the waters cast, the martyr's ashes watched shall gathered be at last and from that scattered dust around us and abroad shall spring a plenteous seed of witnesses for god the father hath received their latest living breath and vain is satan's boast of victory in their death still still though dead they speak and trumpet-tongued proclaim to many awakening land, the one availing name. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrimage by Sir Walter Raleigh From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Pilgrimage Give me my scallop shell of quiet, my staff of faith to walk upon, my scrip of joy, immortal diet, my bottle of salvation, my gown of glory, hope's true gauge, and thus I'll take my pilgrimage. Blood must be my body's balmer, no other balm will there be given, whilst my soul, like quiet palmer, traveleth towards the land of heaven over the silver mountains where spring the nectar fountains there will i kiss the bowl of bliss and drink mine everlasting fill upon every milken hill my soul will be a dry before but after it will thirst no more then by that happy blissful day more peaceful pilgrims i shall see that have cast off their rags of clay and walk apparelled fresh like me i'll take them first to quench their thirst and taste of nectar's suckets at those clear wells where sweetness dwells drawn up by saints in crystal buckets and when our bottles and all we are filled with immortality then the blessed paths will travel strewed with rubies thick as gravel ceilings of diamonds sapphire floors high walls of coral and pearly bowers from thence to heaven's bribeless hall where no corrupted voices brawl no conscience molten into gold no forged accuser bought or sold no cause deferred no vain spent journey for there Christ is the king's attorney, who pleads for all without degrees, and he hath angels, but no fees. And when the grand twelve million jury of our sins, with direful fury, gainst our souls black verdicts give, Christ pleads his death, and then we live. Be thou my speaker, taintless pleader, unblotted lawyer, true proceeder thou givest salvation even for alms not with a bribed lawyer's palms and this is mine eternal plea to him that made heaven earth and sea that since my flesh must die so soon and want a head to dine next noon just at the stroke when my veins start and spread 
set on my soul an everlasting head. Then am I, like a palmer, fit to tread those blessed paths which before I writ, of death and judgment, heaven and hell, who oft doth think, must needs die well. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Master's Touch by Horatius Bonar From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Master's Touch In the still air the music lies unheard In the rough marble beauty hides unseen to make the music and the beauty needs the master's touch, the sculptor's chisel keen. Great master, touch us with thy skilful hand. Let not the music that is in us die. Great sculptor, hew and polish us, nor let, hidden and lost, thy form within us lie. Spare not the stroke, do with us as thou wilt. Let there be naught unfinished, broken, marred. Complete thy purpose, that we may become thy perfect image, thou our God and Lord. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Faithful Angel From Paradise Lost, Book 5 By Milton from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The High Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Ya. The Faithful Angel The Seraph Abdiel, faithful found among the faithless, faithful only he. Among innumerable force, unmoved, unshaken, unseduced, unterrified, his loyalty he kept, his love, his zeal nor number nor example with him wrought to swerve from truth or change his constant mind though single from amidst them forth he passed long way through hostile scorn which he sustained superior nor of violence feared aught and with retorted scorn his back he turned on those proud towers to swift destruction doomed end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Low Spirits by Frederick William Faber From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Low Spirits Fever and fret and aimless stir And disappointed strife All chafing unsuccessful things make up the sum of life love adds anxiety to toil and sameness doubles cares while one unbroken chain of work the flagging temper wears the light and air are dulled with smoke the streets resound with noise and the soul sinks to see its peers chasing their joyless joys Voices are round me, smiles are near, kind welcomes to be had, and yet my spirit is alone, fretful, outworn, and sad. A weary actor, I would fain be quit of my long part. The burden of unquiet life lies heavy on my heart. Sweet thought of God, now do thy work as thou hast done before. Wake up, and tears will wake with thee, and the dull mood be o'er. The very thinking of the thought, without or praise or prayer, Gives light to know, and life to do, and marvellous strength to bear. Oh, there is music in that thought, unto a heart unstrung, Like sweet bells at the evening time, most musically rung. Tis not his justice or his power, beauty or blessed abode, 
but the mere unexpanded thought of the eternal god it is not of his wondrous works not even that he is words fail it but it is a thought which by itself is bliss sweet thought lie closer to my heart that i may feel thee near as one who for his weapon feels in some nocturnal fear mostly in hours of gloom thou comest when sadness makes us lowly as though thou wert the echo sweet of humble melancholy i bless thee lord for this kind check to spirits over free more helpless need of thee and for all things that make me feel end of poem this recording is in the public domain I Saw Thee by Ray Palmer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada I saw thee When thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee I saw thee when, as twilight fell And evening lit her fairest star Thy footsteps sought yon quiet dell the world's confusion left afar. I saw thee when thou stoodst alone, Where drooping branches thick o'erhung, Thy still retreat to all unknown, Hid in deep shadows darkly flung. I saw thee when, as died each sound Of bleating flock or woodland bird, Kneeling, as if on holy ground, Thy voice the listening silence heard. I saw thy calm, uplifted eyes, And marked the heaving of thy breast, When rose to heaven thy heartfelt sighs, For purer life, for perfect rest. I saw the light that o'er thy face stole With a soft, suffusing glow, As if within celestial grace Breathed the same bliss that angels know. I saw what thou didst not, above thy lowly head an open heaven and tokens of thy father's love with smiles to thy rapt spirit given i saw thee from that sacred spot with firm and peaceful soul depart i jesus saw thee doubt it not and read the secrets of thy heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Loss in Delays by Robert Southwell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Loss in Delays Shun delays, they breed remorse. Take thy time while time does serve thee creeping snails have weakest force fly their fault lest thou repent thee good is best when soonest wrought lingering labours come to naught hoist up sail while gale doth last tide and wind stay no man's pleasure seek not time when time is past sober speed is wisdom's leisure after wits are dearly bought let thy forewit guide thy thought time wears all his locks before take thou hold upon his forehead when he flies he turns no more and behind his scalp is naked works adjourned have many stays long demures breed new delays seek thyself while sore is green festered wounds ask deeper lancing after cures are seldom seen often sought scarce ever chancing time and place gives best advice out of season out of price crush the serpent in the head break ill eggs ere they be hatched kill bad chickens in the tread fledged they hardly can be catched in the rising stifle ill lest it grow against thy will drops do pierce the stubborn flint 
not by force but often falling custom kills with feeble dint more by use than strength prevailing single sands have little weight many make a drowning freight tender twigs are bent with ease aged trees do break with bending young desires make little praise growth doth make them past amending happy man that soon doth knock babel's babes against the rock end of poem this recording is in the public domain the seed growing secretly by henry vaughan from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by lian yao the seed growing secretly dear secret greenness nursed below tempests and winds and winter nights vex not that but one sees thee grow that one made all these lesser lights what needs a conscience calm and bright within itself an outward test who breaks his glass to take more light makes way for storms into his rest then bless thy secret growth nor catch at noise but thrive unseen and dumb keep clean bear fruit earn life and watch till the white-winged reapers come end of home this recording is in the public domain. Patience by Paul Hamilton Hain From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Patience She hath no beauty in her face unless the chastened sweetness there and meek long-suffering yield a grace to make her mournful features fair shunned by the gay the proud the young she roams through dim unsheltered ways nor lover's vow nor flatterer's tongue brings music to her sombre days at best her skies are clouded o'er and oft she fronts the stinging sleet or feels on some tempestuous shore the storm waves lash her naked feet where'er she strays or musing stands by lonesome beach by turbulent mart we see her pale half tremulous hands crossed humbly o'er her aching heart within a secret pain she bears a pain too deep to feel the balm an april spirit finds in tears alas all cureless griefs are calm yet in her passionate strength supreme despair beyond her pathway flies awed by the softly steadfast beam of sad but heavenly enamoured eyes who pours to greet her vaguely seem touched by fine wafts of holier air as those who in some mystic dream talk with the angels unaware End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sometime by May Riley Smith From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Sometime Sometime when all life's lessons have been learnt, and sun and stars for evermore have set, the things which our weak judgments here have spurned, the things o'er which we grieved with lashes wet, will flash before us out of life's dark night, as stars shine most in deeper tints of blue, and we shall see how all God's plans are right, and how what seems reproof was love most true and we shall see how while we frown and sigh god's plans go on as best for you and me how when we called he heeded not our cry because his wisdom
to the end could see and e'en as prudent parents disallow too much of sweet to craving babyhood so god perhaps is keeping from us now life's sweetest things because it seemeth good and if sometimes commingled with life's wine we find the wormwood and rebel and shrink be sure a wiser hand than yours or mine pours out this portion for our lips to drink and if some friend we love is lying low where human kisses cannot reach his face oh do not blame the loving father so but wear your sorrow with obedient grace and you shall shortly know that lengthened breath is not the sweetest gift god sends his friend and that sometimes the sable pal of death conceals the fairest bloom his love can send if we could push ajar the gates of life and stand within and all god's working see we could interpret all this doubt and strife and for each mystery could find a key but not to-day then be content poor heart god's plans like lilies pure and white unfold we must not tear the close-shut leaves apart time will reveal the calluses of gold and if through patient toil we reach the land where tired feet with sandals loosed may rest when we shall clearly know and understand i think that we will say god knew the best end of poem this recording is in the public domain Father, Thy Will Be Done, by Sarah Flower Adams, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Father, Thy Will Be Done. He sendeth sun, he sendeth shower, alike they're needful for the flower, and joys and tears alike are sent to give the soul fit nourishment as comes to me or cloud or sun father thy will not mine be done can loving children e'er reprove with murmurs whom they trust and love creator i would ever be a trusting loving child to thee as comes to me or cloud or sun father thy will not mine be done o oh, ne'er will i at life repine enough that thou hast made it mine when falls the shadow cold of death i yet will sing with parting breath as comes to me or shade or sun father thy will not mine be done end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Prospect by Elizabeth Barrett Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Prospect Methinks we do as fretful children do Leaning their faces on the window pane to sigh the glass dim with their own breath's stain and shut the sky and landscape from their view and thus alas since god the maker drew a mystic separation twixt those twain the life beyond us and our souls in pain we miss the prospect which we are called unto by grief we are fools to use be still and strong O oh man, my brother, hold thy sobbing breath, And keep thy soul's large windows pure from wrong, That so, as life's appointment issueth, Thy vision may be clear to watch along The sunset consummation lights of death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lost Pliad by William Gilmore. 
From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. The Lost Pliad. Not in the sky where it was seen, nor on the white tops of the glistening wave, nor in the mansions of the hidden deep, though green and beautiful, its caves of mystery shall the bright watchers have a place and as of old high station keep gone gone o oh, never more to cheer the mariner who holds his course alone on the atlantic through the weary night when the stars turn to watchers and to sleep shall it appear with the sweet fixedness of certain light down shining on the shut eyes of the deep vain vain hopeless most idly then shall he look forth that mariner from his bark how e'er the north does raise his certain lamp when tempests lower he sees no more that perished light again and gloomier grows the hour which may not through the thick and crowding dark restore that lost and loved one to her tower he looks the shepherd of chaldes hills tending his flocks and wonders the rich beacon does not blaze gladdening his gaze and from his dreary watch along the rocks guiding him safely home through perilous ways still wandering as the drowsy silent fills the sorrowful scene and every hour distills its leaden dews how chafes he at the night still slow to bring the expected and sweet light so natural to his sight and lone where its first splendours shone shall be that pleasant company of stars how should they know the death such perfect beauty mars and like the earth its crimson bloom and breath fallen from on high their lights grow blasted by its touch and die all their concerted springs of harmony snapped rudely and the generous music gone a strain a mellow strain a wailing sweetness filled the sky the stars lamenting in unborrowed pain that one of their selectest ones must die must vanish when most lovely from the rest alas tis evermore our destiny the hope heart cherished is the soonest lost the flower first button soonest feels the frost are not the shortest lived still loveliest and like the pale star shooting down the sky look they not ever brightest when they fly the desolate home they blessed end of poem this recording is in the public domain passing away by john pierpont from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter as the narrator and lian yao as the girl passing away was it the chime of a tiny bell that came so sweet to my dreaming ear like the silvery tones of a fairy's shell that he winds on the beach so mellow and clear when the winds and the waves lie together asleep and the moon and the fairy are watching the deep she dispensing her silvery light and he his notes as silvery quite while the bowman listens and ships his oar to catch the music that comes from the shore hark the notes on my ear that play are set to words as they float they say passing away passing away but no it was not a fairy's shell blown on the beach so mellow and clear 
nor was it the tongue of a silver bell striking the hour that filled my ear as i lay in my dream yet was it a chime that told of the flow of the stream of time for a beautiful clock from the ceiling hung and a plump little girl for a pendulum swung as you've sometimes seen in a little ring that hangs in his cage a canary bird swing and she held to her bosom a budding bouquet and as she enjoyed it she seemed to say passing away passing away oh how bright were the wheels that told of the lapse of time as they moved round slow and the hands, as they swept over the dial of gold, seemed to point to the girl below, and lo, she had changed. In a few short hours, her bouquet had become a garland of flowers that she held in her outstretched hands, and flung this way and that, as she, dancing, swung in the fullness of grace and of womanly pride, that told me she soon was to be a bride. Yet then, when expecting her happiest day, in the same sweet voice I heard her say, Passing away, passing away. While I gazed at that fair one's cheek, a shade of thought or care stole softly over, like that by a cloud in a summer's day made, looking down on a field of blossoming clover. The rose yet lay on her cheek, but its flush had something lost of its brilliant blush, and the light in her eye, and the light on the wheels that marched so calmly round above her, was a little dimmed, as when evening steals upon noon's hot face. Yet one couldn't but love her, for she looked like a mother whose first babe lay rocked on her breast, as she swung all day, and she seemed in the same silver tone to say passing away passing away while yet i looked what a change there came her eye was quenched and her cheek was wan stooping and staffed was her withered frame yet just as busily swung she on the garland beneath her had fallen to dust the wheels above her were eaten with rust the hands that over the dial swept grew crooked and tarnished, but on they kept, and still there came that silver tone from the shriveled lips of the toothless crone. Let me never forget till my dying day the tone or the burden of her lay. Passing away, passing away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines Found in his Bible in the Gatehouse at Westminster by Sir Walter Raleigh From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao Lines E'en such is time, that takes in trust our youth, our joys, our all we have, and pays us but with earth and dust who in the dark and silent grave when we have wandered all our ways shuts up the story of our days but from this earth this grave this dust my god shall raise me up i trust end of poem this recording is in the public domain My Ain Country by Mary Lee de Marist. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. My Ain Country. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Hebrews, Chapter 11, Verse 16. I'm far frae my hame, and I'm weary aften whiles. For the land for hame bringing, and my father's welcome smiles. I'll never be full content until mine e'en do see the shining gates of heaven in my own country. The earth is flecked with flowers, 
money tinted, fresh and gay, the birdies warble blithely, for my father made them say. But these sights and these sounds will as naething be to me, when I hear the angels singing in my ain country. I've his good word of promise that some gladsome day the king to his ain royal palace his banished hain will bring. We e'en and we hearts running o'er, we shall see the king in his beauty in our ain country. My sins hae been money, and my sorrows hae been sair, but there they'll ne'er vex me, nor be remembered mair. His blood has made me white, his hand shall dry my knee, when he brings me home at last to my ain country. Like a bairn to its mither, a wee birdie to its nest, I would fain be ganging new unto my Saviour's breast, for he gathers in his bosom witless, worthless lambs like me, and carries them himsay to his ain country. He's faithful that hath promised he'll surely come again, he'll keep his tryst with me at what hour I dinna ken. But he bids me still to wait, and ready I to be, to gang at any moment to my ain country. So I'm watching I, and singing all my home as I wait, for the sounding o' his footfall this side the shining gate. God gie his grace to ill gain what listens new to me, that we are may gang in gladness to our ain country. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Coming by Barbara Miller MacAndrew from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Four, The Higher Life, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator, Craig Franklin as the Lord, and Lian Yao as the Angel. Coming. At even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, Mark, Chapter Thirteen, Verse Thirty-Five it may be in the evening when the work of the day is done and you have time to sit in the twilight and watch the sinking sun while the long bright day dies slowly over the sea and the hour grows quiet and holy with thoughts of me while you hear the village children passing along the street among those thronging footsteps may come the sound of my feet therefore i tell you watch by the light of the evening star when the room is growing dusky as the clouds afar let the door be on the latch in your home for it may be through the gloaming i will come it may be when the midnight is heavy upon the land and the black waves lying dumbly along the sand when the moonless night draws close and the lights are out in the house when the fires burn low and red and the watch is ticking loudly beside the bed though you sleep tired out on your couch still your heart must wake and watch in the dark room for it may be that at midnight i will come it may be at the cockcrow when the night is dying slowly in the sky and the sea looks calm and holy waiting for the dawn of the golden sun which draweth nigh when the mists are on the valleys shading the rivers chill and my morning star is fading fading over the hill behold i say unto you watch let the door be on the latch in your home in the chill before the dawning between the night and morning i may come it may be in the morning when the sun is bright and strong and the dew is glittering sharply over the little lawn when the waves are laughing loudly along the shore and the little birds are singing sweetly about the door with the long day's work before you you rise up with the sun and the neighbours come in to talk a little of all that must be done but remember 
that i may be the next to come in at the door to call you from all your busy work for evermore as you work your heart must watch for the door is on the latch in your room and it may be in the morning i will come so he passed down my cottage garden by the path that leads to the sea till he came to the turn of the little road where the birch and laburnum tree lean over and arch the way there i saw him a moment stay and turn once more to me as i wept at the cottage door and lift up his hands in blessing then i saw his face no more and i stood still in the doorway leaning against the wall not heeding the fair white roses though i crushed them and let them fall only looking down the pathway and looking toward the sea and wondering and wondering when he would come back for me till i was aware of an angel who was going swiftly by with the gladness of one who goeth in the light of god most high he passed the end of the cottage toward the garden gate i suppose he was come down at the setting of the sun to comfort some one in the village whose dwelling was desolate and he paused before the door beside my place and the likeness of a smile was on his face weep not he said for unto you is given to watch for the coming of his feet who is the glory of our blessed heaven the work and watching will be very sweet even in an earthly home and in such an hour as you think not he will come so i am watching quietly every day whenever the sun shines brightly i rise and say surely it is the shining of his face and look unto the gates of his high place beyond the sea for i know he is coming shortly to summon me and when a shadow falls across the window of my room where i am working my appointed task i lift my head to watch the door and ask if he is come and the angel answers sweetly in my home only a few more shadows and he will come end of poem this recording is in the public domain euthanasia by willis gaylord clark from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by thomas peter euthanasia methinks when on the languid eye life's autumn scenes grow dim when evening's shadows veil the sky and pleasure's siren hymn grows fainter on the tuneless ear like echoes from another sphere or dreams of seraphim it were not sad to cast away this dull and cumbrous load of clay it were not sad to feel the heart grow passionless and cold to feel those longings to depart that cheered the good of old to clasp the faith which looks on high which fires a christian's dying eye and makes the curtain fold that falls upon his wasting breast the door that leads to endless rest it seems not lonely thus to lie on that triumphant bed till the pure spirit mounts on high by white-winged seraphs led where glories earth may never know or many mansions lingering glow in peerless luster shed it were not lonely thus to soar where sin and grief can sting no more and though the way to such a goal lies through the clouded tomb if on the free unfettered soul there rest no stains of gloom how should its aspirations rise far through the blue unpillared skies up to its final home beyond the journeyings of the sun where streams of living waters run end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Last Man by Thomas Campbell From 
The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The High Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao as the narrator. And Thomas Peter as the last man. The last man. All worldly shapes shall melt in gloom. The sun himself must die. Before this mortal shall assume its immortality. I saw a vision in my sleep that gave my spirit strength to sweep adown the gulf of time i saw the last of human mould that shall creation's death behold as adam saw her prime the sun's eye had a sickly glare the skeletons of nations were around that lonely man some had expired in fight the brands still rusted in their bony hands in plague and famine some earth cities had no sound nor tread and ships were drifting with the dead to shores where all was dumb yet prophet-like that lone one stood with dauntless words and high that shook the sere leaves from the wood as if a storm passed by saying we are twins in death proud son thy face is cold thy race is run tis mercy bids thee go for thou ten thousand thousand years hast seen the tide of human tears that shall no longer flow what though beneath thee man put forth his pomp his pride his skill and arts that made fire flood and earth the vassals of his will yet mourn i not thy parted sway thou dim discrowned king of day for all those trophied arts and triumphs that beneath thee sprang healed not a passion or a pang entailed on human hearts go let oblivion's curtain fall upon the stage of men nor with thy rising beams recall life's tragedy again its piteous pageants bring not back no waken flesh upon the rack of pain and you drive stretched in diseases shapes aboard a moan in battle by the sword like grass beneath the scythe even i am weary in yon skies to watch thy fading fire test of all sumless agonies behold not me expire my lips that speak thy dirge of death their rounded gasp and gurgling breath to see thou shalt not boast the eclipse of nature spreads my pall the majesty of darkness shall receive my parting ghost this spirit shall return to him who gave its heavenly spark yet think not son it shall be dim when thou thyself art dark no it shall live again and shine in bliss unknown to beams of thine by him recalled to breath who captive led captivity who robbed the grave of victory and took the sting from death go son while mercy holds me up on nature's awful waste to drink this last and bitter cup of grief that man shall taste go tell the night that hides thy face thou saw'st the last of adam's race on earth's sepulchral clot the darkening universe defy to quench his immortality or shake his trust in god end of poem this recording is in the public domain when by sarah woolsey susan coolidge from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia when if i were told that i must die to-morrow that the next sun which sinks should bear me past all fear and sorrow for any one all the fight fought all the short journey through what should i do i do not think that i should shrink or falter but just go on doing my work nor change nor seek to alter aught that is gone 
but rise and move and love and smile and pray for one more day and lying down at night for a last sleeping say in that ear which hearkens ever lord within thy keeping how should i fear and when to-morrow brings thee nearer still do thou thy will i might not sleep for awe but peaceful tender my soul would lie all the night long and when the morning splendour flushed over the sky i think that i could smile could calmly say it is his day but if a wondrous hand from the blue yonder held out a scroll on which my life was writ and i with wonder beheld unroll to a long century's end its mystic clue what should i do what could i do o blessed guide and master other than this still to go on as now not slower faster nor fear to miss the road although so very long it be while led by thee step after step feeling thee close beside me although unseen through thorns through flowers whether the tempest hide thee or heaven serene assured thy faithfulness cannot betray thy love decay i may not know my god no hand revealeth thy counsels wise along the path a deepening shadow stealeth no voice replies to all my questioning thought the time to tell and it is well let me keep on abiding and unfearing thy will always through a long century's ripening fruition or a short days thou canst not come too soon and i can wait if thou come late end of poem this recording is in the public domain burial of moses by cecil francis alexander from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada burial of moses and he buried him in a valley in the land of moab over against beth peor but no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day deuteronomy chapter thirty four verse six by nebo's lonely mountain on this side jordan's wave in a vale in the land of moab there lies a lonely grave but no man built that sepulchre and no man saw it e'er for the angels of god upturned the sod and laid the dead man there that was the grandest funeral that ever passed on earth yet no man heard the trampling or saw the train go forth noiselessly as daylight comes back when night is done and the crimson streak on ocean's cheek grows into the great sun noiselessly as the springtime her crown of verdure weaves and all the trees on all the hills unfold their thousand leaves so without sound of music or voice of them that wept silently down from the mountain's crown the great procession swept perchance the old bald eagle on grey beth peor's height out of his rocky airy looked on the wondrous sight perchance the lion stalking still shuns that hollowed spot for beast and bird have seen and heard that which man knoweth not but when the warrior dieth his comrades of the war with arms reversed and muffled drums follow the funeral car they show the banners taken they tell his battles won and after him lead his masterless steed while peals the minute gun amid the noblest of the land men lay the sage to rest and give the bard an honoured place with costly marbles dressed in the great minster transept where lights like glories fall and the sweet choir sings and the organ rings along the emblazoned hall 
this was the greatest warrior that ever buckled sword this the most gifted poet that ever breathed a word and never earth's philosopher traced with his glorious pen on the deathless page truth's half so sage as he wrote down for men and had he not high honor the hillside for a pall to lie in state while angels wait with stars for tapers tall and the dark rock pines like tossing plumes over his bier to wave and god's own hand in that lonely land to lay him in his grave in that strange grave without a name whence his uncoffined clay shall break again o wondrous thought before the judgment day and stand with glory wrapped around on the hills he never trod and speak of the strife that won our life with the incarnate son of god o lonely tomb in moab's land o dark beth peor's hill speak to these curious hearts of ours and teach them to be still god hath his mysteries of grace ways that we cannot tell he hides them deep like the secret sleep of him he loved so well end of poem this recording is in the public domain the resignation by thomas chatterton from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter the resignation o god whose thunder shakes the sky whose eye this atom globe surveys to thee my only rock i fly thy mercy in thy justice praise the mystic mazes of thy will the shadows of celestial light are past the power of human skill but what the eternal acts is right oh teach me in the trying hour when anguish swells the dewy tear to still my sorrows own my power thy goodness love thy justice fear if in this bosom aught but thee encroaching sought a boundless sway omniscience could the danger see and mercy look the cause away then why my soul dost thou complain why drooping seek the dark recess shake off the melancholy chain for god created all to bless but ah my breast is human still the rising sigh the falling tear my languid vitals feeble rill the sickness of my soul declare but yet with fortitude resigned i'll thank the inflictor of the blow forbid the sigh compose my mind nor let the gush of misery flow the gloomy mantle of the night which on my sinking spirit steals will vanish at the morning light which god my east my sun reveals end of poem this recording is in the public domain Only Waiting by Francis Lawton Mace From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Only Waiting A very aged man in an almshouse was asked what he was doing now. He replied, Only Waiting only waiting till the shadows are a little longer grown. Only waiting till the glimmer of the day's last beam is flown. Till the night of earth is faded from the heart, once full of day. Till the stars of heaven are breaking through the twilight soft and gray. Only waiting till the reapers have the last sheaf gathered home. For the summer time is faded, and the autumn winds have come. Quickly, reapers, gather quickly the last ripe hours of my heart, for the bloom of life is withered, 
and I hasten to depart, only waiting till the angels open wide the mystic gate, at whose feet I long have lingered, weary, poor, and desolate. Even now I hear the footsteps, and their voices far away. If they call me, I am waiting, only waiting to obey, only waiting till the shadows are a little longer grown, only waiting till the glimmer of the day's last beam is flown. Then out from the gathered darkness, holy, deathless stars shall rise, by whose light my soul shall gladly tread its pathway to the skies. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hopefully Waiting by Anson D. F. Randolph From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Hopefully Waiting Blessed are they who are homesick, for they shall come at last to their father's house. Heinrich Stilling. Not as you meant, O learned man and good, do I accept thy words of truth and rest. God, knowing all, knows what for me is best, and gives me what I need, not what he could, nor always as I would. I shall go to the Father's house and see him and the elder brother face to face, what day or hour I know not. Let me be steadfast in work, and earnest in the race, not as a homesick child who all day long whines at its play, and seldom speaks in song. If for a time some loved one goes away, and leaves us our appointed work to do, can we to him or to ourselves be true, in mourning his departure day by day, and so our work delay? Nay, if we love and honour, we shall make the absence brief by doing well our task, not for ourselves, but for the dear one's sake, and at his coming only of him ask approval of the work, which most was done, not for ourselves, but our beloved one. Our father's house, I know, is broad and grand, in it how many, many mansions are, and far beyond the light of sun or star, four little ones of mine through that fair land are walking hand in hand. Think you I love not, or that I forget these of my loins? Still this world is fair, and I am singing while my eyes are wet with weeping in this balmy summer air. Yet I am not homesick, and the children here have need of me and so my way is clear. I would be joyful as my days go by, counting God's mercies to me. He who bore life's heaviest cross is mine for evermore, and I who wait his coming, shall not I on his sure word rely? And if sometimes the way be rough and steep, be heavy for the grief he sends to me, or at my waking I would only weep, let me remember these are things to be, to work his blessed will until he comes, to take my hand and lead me safely home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sit Down, Sad Soul by Brian Waller Proctor Barry Cornwall from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Sit Down, Sad Soul Sit down, sad soul, and count the moments flying. Come, tell the sweet amount that's lost by sighing. How many smiles? A score? Then laugh, and count no more, for day is dying. Lie down, sad soul, and sleep, and no more measure the flight of time, nor weep the loss of leisure. But here, by this lone stream, lie down with us, 
and dream of starry treasure. We dream, do thou the same, we love for ever, we laugh yet few, we shame the gentle never. Stay then, till sorrow dies, then hope and happy skies are thine for ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. It kindles all my soul by Casimir of Poland, translated from the Latin by John Mason Neal, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. It kindles all my soul. Urit me patriae decor. It kindles all my soul, my country's loveliness. Those starry choirs that watch around the pole, and the moon's tender light, and heavenly fires through golden halls that roll. O chorus of the night, O planets, swarm the music of the spheres to follow. Lovely watchers that think scorn to rest till day appears. Me, for celestial homes of glory born, why here? Oh, why so long do ye behold an exile from on high? Here, O oh, ye shining throng, with lilies spread the mound where I shall lie. Here let me drop my chain, and dust to dust returning, cast away the trammels that remain. The rest of me shall spring to endless day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Epilogue by Robert Browning From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Epilogue At the midnight, in the silence of the sleep-time, When you set your fancies free, Will they pass to where, by death, fools think imprisoned, Lo, he lies who once so loved you, Whom you loved so, pity me oh to love so be so loved yet so mistaken what had i on earth to do with the slothful with the mawkish the unmanly like the aimless helpless hopeless did i drivel being who one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better sleep to wake no at noonday in the bustle of man's work time greet the unseen with a cheer bid him forward breast and back as either should be strive and thrive cry speed fight on fare ever there as here end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Crossing the Bar by Alfred Lord Tennyson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Crossing the Bar Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me and may there be no moaning of the bar when i put out to sea but such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home twilight and evening bell and after that the dark and may there be no sadness of farewell when i embark for though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
the dying christian to his soul by alexander pope from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia the dying christian to his soul vital spark of heavenly flame quit oh quit this mortal frame trembling hoping lingering flying oh the pain the bliss of dying cease fond nature cease thy strife and let me languish into life hark they whisper angels say sister spirit come away what is this absorbs me quite steals my senses shuts my sight drowns my spirits draws my breath tell me my soul can this be death the world recedes it disappears heaven opens on my eyes my ears with sounds seraphic ring lend lend your wings i mount i fly o grave where is thy victory o death where is thy sting end of poem this recording is in the public domain ode intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood by william wordsworth from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia thomas peter jason in canada craig franklin and lian ya ode intimations of immortality from recollections of early childhood one there was a time when meadow grove and stream the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light the glory and the freshness of the dream it is not now as it hath been of yore turn wheresoever i may by night or day the things which i have seen i now can see no more Two the rainbow comes and goes and lovely is the rose the moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair the sunshine is a glorious birth but yet i know where'er i go that there hath passed away a glory from the earth three now while the birds thus sing a joyous song and while the young lambs bound as to the tabor's sound to me alone there came a thought of grief a timely utterance that gave that thought relief and i again am strong the cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep no more shall grief of mine the season wrong i hear the echoes through the mountains throng the winds come to me from the fields of sleep and all the earth is gay land and sea give themselves up to jollity and with the heart of may doth every beast keep holiday thou child of joy shout round me let me hear thy shouts thou happy shepherd boy Four ye blessed creatures i have heard the call ye to each other make i see the heavens laugh with you in your jubilee my heart is at your festival my head hath its coronal the fullness of your bliss i feel i feel it all o evil day if i were sullen while earth herself is adorning the sweet may morning and the children are culling on every side in a thousand valleys far and wide fresh flowers while the sun shines warm and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm i hear i hear with joy i hear but there's a tree of many one a single field which i have looked upon both of them speak of something that is gone the pansy at my feet 
doth the same tale repeat whither is fled the visionary gleam where is it now the glory and the dream five our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us our life star hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness but trailing clouds of glory do we come from god who was our home heaven lies about us in our infancy shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy but he beholds the light and whence it flows he sees it in his joy the youth who daily farther from the east must travel still is nature's priest and by the vision splendid is on his way attended at length the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day six earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own yearnings she hath in her own natural kind and even with something of a mother's mind and no unworthy aim the homely nurse doth all she can to make her foster child her inmate man forget the glories he hath known and that imperial palace whence he came seven behold the child among his newborn blisses a six years darling of a pygmy size see where mid work of his own hand he lies fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses with light upon him from his father's eyes see at his feet some little plan or chart some fragment from his dream of human life shaped by himself the newly learned art a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral and this hath now his heart and unto this he frames his song then will he fit his tongue to dialogues of business love or strife but it will not be long ere this be thrown aside and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to palsied age that life brings with her in her equipage as if his whole vocation were endless imitation eight thou whose exterior semblance doth belie thy soul's immensity thou best philosopher who yet dost keep thy heritage thou i among the blind that deaf and silent readst the eternal deep haunted forever by the eternal mind mighty prophet seer blessed on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find in darkness lost the darkness of the grave thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a presence which is not to be put by thou little child yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height with thy such earnest pains dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life nine o joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benediction not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood were the busy or at rest with new fledged hope still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised 
but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day and yet a master light of all our seeing uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truths that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in moments travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore ten then sing ye birds sing sing a joyous song and let the young lambs bound as to the tabors sound we in thought will join your throng ye that pipe and ye that play ye that through your hearts to-day feel the gladness of the may what though the radiance which was once so bright be now for ever taken from my sight though nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass of glory in the flower we will grieve not rather find strength in what remains behind in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering in the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind eleven and o oh, ye fountains meadows hills and groves forebode not any severing of our loves yet in my heart of hearts i feel your might i only have relinquished one delight to live beneath your more habitual sway i love the brooks which down their channels fret even more than when i tripped lightly as day the innocent brightness of a new-born day is lovely yet the clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober colouring from an eye that hath kept watch over man's mortality another race hath been and other palms are won thanks to the human heart by which we live thanks to its tenderness its joys and fears to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears end of poem this recording is in the public domain soliloquy on immortality from cato act five scene one by joseph edison from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for librivox dot org by sonia as the narrator and Craig Franklin as Cato. Soliloquy on Immortality From Cato, Act 5, Scene 1 Scene Cato, sitting in a thoughtful posture, with book on the immortality of the soul in his hand, and a drawn sword on the table by him. It must be so, Plato, thou reasonest well. Else whence this pleasing hope this fond desire this longing after immortality or whence this secret dread and inward horror of falling into naught why shrinks the soul back on herself and startles at destruction tis the divinity that stirs within us tis heaven itself that points out a hereafter and intimates eternity to man eternity thou pleasing dreadful thought through what variety of untried being through what new scenes and changes must we pass the wide the unbounded prospect lies before me but shadows clouds and darkness rest upon it here will i hold if there's a power above us and that there is all nature cries aloud through all her works he must delight in virtue and that which he delights in must be happy but when or where this world was made for caesar 
I'm weary of conjectures. This must end them. Laying his hand on his sword. Thus am I doubly armed. My death and life, my bane and antidote, are both before me. This in a moment brings me to an end. But this informs me I shall never die. The soul, secured in her existence, smiles at the drawn dagger and defies its point. The stars shall fade away, the sun himself grow dim with age and nature sink in years. But thou shalt flourish in immortal youth, unhurt amid the war of elements, the wrecks of matter and the crush of worlds. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Edwin and Paulinus. The Conversion of Northumbria. By Anonymous. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4. The Higher Life, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org. By Sonia as the narrator. Thomas Peter as Paulinus. Craig Franklin as the Old Warrior and Jason in Canada as the Northumbrians. Edwin and Paulinus, The Conversion of Northumbria. The black-haired, gaunt Paulinus by ruddy Edwin stood. Bow down, O King of Dera, before the blessed rood. Cast out thy heathen idols and worship Christ our Lord. But Edwin looked and pondered, and answered not a word again the gaunt paulinus to ruddy edwin spake god offers life immortal for his dear son's own sake wilt thou not hear his message who bears the keys and sword but edwin looked and pondered and answered not a word rose then a sage old warrior was five score winters old whose beard from chin to girdle like one long snow wreath rolled at yule time in our chamber we sit in warmth and light while cold and howling round us lies the black land of night athwart the room a sparrow darts from the open door within the happy hearth light one red flash and no more we see it come from darkness, and into darkness go. So is our life, King Edwin, alas that it is so. But if this pale Paulinus have somewhat more to tell, some news of whence and whither, and where the soul will dwell, if on that outer darkness the sun of hope may shine, he makes life worth the living i take his god for mine so spake the wise old warrior and all about him cried paulinus's god hath conquered and he shall be our guide for he makes life worth living who brings this message plain when our brief days are over that we shall live again end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Undiscovered Country by Edmund Clarence Stedman From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Undiscovered Country Could we but know the land that ends our dark, uncertain travel, Where lie those happier hills and meadows low, Ah, if beyond the spirit's inmost cavil aught of that country would we surely know, who would not go? Might we but hear the hovering angel's high imagined chorus, or catch betimes with wakeful eyes and clear one radiant vista of the realm before us, with one rapt moment given to see and hear, ah, who would fear? 
Were we quite sure to find the peerless friend who left us lonely, or there, by some celestial stream as pure, to gaze in eyes that here were lovelit only, this weary mortal coil, were we quite sure, who would endure? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song of the Silent Land by Johann Godans von Salis, translated from the German by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Song of the Silent Land, Das Stil Land. Into the Silent Land, ah, who shall lead us thither? Clouds in the evening sky more darkly gather and shattered wrecks lie thicker on the strand. Who leads us with a gentle hand tither, O oh, tither, into the silent land? Into the silent land, to you, ye boundless regions of all perfection, tender morning visions of beauteous souls, the future's pledge and band. Who in life's battle firm doth stand shall bear hope's tender blossoms, into the silent land o oh, land o oh, land for all the broken-hearted the mildest herald by our fate allotted beckons and with inverted torch doth stand to lead us with a gentle hand into the land of the great departed into the silent land end of poem this recording is in the public domain THE OTHER WORLD by Harriet Beecher Stowe From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin THE OTHER WORLD It lies around us like a cloud, a world we do not see, yet the sweet closing of an eye may bring us there to be its gentle breezes fan our cheek amid our worldly cares its gentle voices whisper love and mingle with our prayers sweet hearts around us throb and beat sweet helping hands are stirred and palpitates the veil between with breathings almost heard the silence awful sweet and calm they have no power to break for mortal words are not for them to utter or partake so thin so soft so sweet they glide so near to press they seem they seem to lull us to our rest and melt into our dream and in the hush of rest they bring tis easy now to see how lovely and how sweet to pass the hour of death may be. To close the eye and close the ear, wrapped in a trance of bliss, and gently dream in loving arms to swoon to that from this. Scarce knowing if we wake or sleep, scarce asking where we are, to feel all evil sink away, all sorrow and all care. Sweet souls around us, watch us still, press nearer to our side, into our thoughts, into our prayers, with gentle helpings glide. Let death between us be as naught, a dried and vanished stream. Your joy be the reality, our suffering life the dream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Heaven by Emily Dickinson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Heaven I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea, Yet know I how the heather looks, 
and what a wave must be. I never spake with God, nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot as if the chart were given. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thoughts of Heaven by Robert Nichol From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4 The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter Thoughts of Heaven High thoughts, they come and go Like the soft breathings of a listening maiden While round me flow the winds From woods and fields with gladness laden when the corn's rustle on the ear doth come, When the eve's beetle sounds its drowsy hum, When the stars, dewdrops of the summer sky, Watch over all with soft and loving eye, While the leaves quiver by the lone river, And the quiet heart from depths doth call And garners all, Earth grows a shadow, forgotten whole, and heaven lives in the blessed soul. High thoughts, they are with me, When, deep within the bosom of the forest, Thy morning melody abroad into the sky, Thou throstle, poorest. When the young sunbeams glance among the trees, When on the ear comes the soft song of bees, When every branch has its own favorite bird, and songs of summer from each thicket heard, Where the owl flitteth, where the rose sitteth, And holiness seems sleeping there, While nature's prayer goes up to heaven in purity, Till all is glory and joy to me. High thoughts, they are my own, When I am resting on a mountain's bosom, And see below me strown, the huts and homes where humble virtues blossom. When I can trace each streamlet through the meadow, When I can follow every fitful shadow, When I can watch the winds among the corn, And see the waves along the forest borne, Where bluebell and heather are blooming together, And far doth come the sabbath bell, Or wood and fell, I hear the beating, of nature's heart heaven is before me god thou art high thoughts they visit us in moments when the soul is dim and darkened they come to bless after the vanities to which we hearkened when weariness hath come upon the spirit those hours of darkness which we all inherit Bursts there not through a glint of warm sunshine A winged thought which bids us not repine? In joy and gladness, in mirth and sadness, Come signs and tokens. Life's angel brings upon its wings Those bright communings the soul doth keep, Those thoughts of heaven so pure and deep. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Nearer Home by Phoebe Carey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Nearer Home One sweetly solemn thought comes to me o'er and o'er I am nearer home today than I have ever been before. Nearer my father's house, where the many mansions be, Nearer the great white throne, nearer the crystal sea, Nearer the bound of life, where we lay our burdens down, Nearer leaving the cross, nearer gaining the crown. But lying darkly between, winding down through the night, is the silent, unknown stream that leads at last to the light. Closer and closer my steps come to the dread abysm. Closer death to my lips presses the awful chrism. 
oh, if my mortal feet have almost gained the brink, if it be I am nearer home even today than I think. Father, perfect my trust, let my spirit feel in death that her feet are firmly set on the rock of a living faith. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Meeting Above by William Leggett From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The High Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Meeting Above If you bright stars which gem the night Be each a blissful dwelling sphere Where kindred spirits reunite Whom death hath torn asunder here How sweet it were at once to die to leave this blighted orb afar, mixed soul and soul to cleave the sky, and soar away from star to star. But oh, how dark, how drear, how lone would seem the brightest world of bliss, if wandering through each radiant one, we failed to meet the loved of this. If there no more the tire shall twine, which death's cold hand alone could sever, ah. Oh, would those stars in mockery shine, more joyless as they shine for ever? It cannot be. Each hope, each fear that lights the eye or clouds the brow, proclaims there is a happier sphere than this bleak world that holds us now. There, Lord, thy wayward saints shall find the bliss for which they longed before, and holiest sympathy shall bind thine own to thee for evermore. O oh, Jesus, bring us to that rest where all the ransomed shall be found, in thine eternal fullness blessed, while ages roll their cycles round. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Days Among the Dead by Robert Southey from the world's best poetry volume 4 the higher life part 2 read for librivox.org by craig franklin my days among the dead my days among the dead are past around me i behold where e'er these casual eyes are cast the mighty minds of old my never failing friends are they with whom I converse day by day. With them I take delight in weal, and seek relief in woe, and while I understand and feel how much to them I owe, my cheeks have often been bedewed with tears of thoughtful gratitude. My thoughts are with the dead, with them I live in long past years, their virtues love, their faults condemn, partake their hopes and fears, and from their lessons seek and find instruction with a humble mind. My hopes are with the dead, anon my place with them will be, and I with them shall travel on through all futurity, yet leaving here a name I trust that will not perish in the dust. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Future Life by William Cullen Bryant From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 4, The Higher Life, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Future Life how shall I know thee in the sphere which keeps the disembodied spirits of the dead, when all of thee that time could wither sleeps and perishes among the dust we tread? For I shall feel the sting of ceaseless pain if there I meet thy gentle presence not, nor hear the voice I love, nor read again in thy serenest eyes the tender thought. Will not thy own meek heart demand me there? That heart whose fondest throbs to me were given, 
My name on earth was ever in thy prayer, And wilt thou never utter it in heaven? In meadows fanned by heaven's life-breathing wind, In the resplendence of that glorious sphere, And larger movements of the unfettered mind, Wilt thou forget the love that joined us here? The love that lived through all the stormy past, and meekly with my harsher nature bore, and deeper grew, and tenderer to the last, shall it expire with life, and be no more? A happier lot than mine, and larger light, await thee there, for thou hast bowed thy will in cheerful homage to the rule of right, and lovest all, and renderest good for ill. For me, the sordid cares in which I dwell shrink and consume my heart as heat the scroll, and wrath has left its scar, that fire of hell has left its frightful scar upon my soul. Yet though thou wearest the glory of the sky, wilt thou not keep the same beloved name, the same fair thoughtful brow and gentle eye, lovelier in heaven's sweet climate, yet the same? Shalt thou not teach me that in calmer home the wisdom that I learned so ill in this, the wisdom which is love, till I become thy fit companion in that land of bliss? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Heaven by Anonymous from the world's best poetry volume four the higher life part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin heaven that climb is not like this dull climb of ours all all is brightness there a sweeter influence breathes around its flowers and a benigner air no calm below is like that calm above no region here is like that realm of love. Earth's softest spring ne'er shed so soft a light. Earth's brightest summer never shone so bright. That sky is not like this sad sky of ours, tinged with earth's change and care. No shadow dims it, and no rain cloud lowers, no broken sunshine there. One everlasting stretch of azure pours its stainless splendor o'er those sinless shores. For there Jehovah shines with heavenly ray, and Jesus reigns, dispensing endless day. The dwellers there are not like those of earth. No mortal stain they bear, and yet they seem of kindred blood and birth. Whence and how came they there? earth was their native soil from sin and shame through tribulation they to glory came bond slaves delivered from sin's crushing load brands plucked from burning by the hand of god yon robes of theirs are not like those below no angels half so bright whence came that beauty whence that living glow and whence that radiant white washed in the blood of the atoning lamb fair as the light these robes of theirs became and now all tears wiped off from every eye they wander where the freshest pastures lie through all the nightless day of that unfading sky end of poem this recording is in the public domain